Genesis 29, 31. I mean, Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. We're going to go all the way to Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. Verse 24. Last week, we saw the providential hand of God in Jacob's life. God providentially brought Jacob to a well where he met shepherds who knew Laban. God providentially brought Rachel to Jacob while he was at this well, and it was literally love at first sight. He looked to the horizon, and it was like a movie where she's walking towards him in slow motion. Uh, He was just stunned by her beauty. And then we saw that God used Laban's sin providentially to refine Jacob. Jacob worked seven long years to marry Rachel, and then he gets time for the wedding, and the the wedding happens, and he comes to find out that he married the wrong sister, Leah. But we saw that God was providentially at work throughout this whole thing, and the same will be true today. We will see the providential hand of God, and as I was studying this passage, I couldn't help but think about Romans chapter 8, 28. You know, I, I believe every road in the Bible leads to Romans chapter 8, doesn't it? Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that this morning? If you are a Christian, if you have been transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of God's word, if God has made you new, this text applies to you. That no matter what you're going through, all things work for good. That God uses all things for good, for his glory and for your sanctification, his glory and to prepare you for heaven. That means every little thing you go through in this life, it's not meaningless. It is purposeful. God is using it for good. And so this story this morning is about many different things. This is a story about two sisters who have married the same man. This is a story about a husband who is passive and who doesn't remind his family about the promises of God. This is a story about sibling rivalry, an unloved wife, This is a story about the pain of barrenness. But at its core, this entire story can be summarized in one way, and that one way is this. God brings good out of evil. God brings good out of evil. And what you have to understand today, Grace family, is that if you are a Christian, God can and he will bring good out of the evils that happen within your own family. That thought might be difficult for you to believe this morning, but it is true and it is a single thread that we see throughout all of the Bible. And so that means we can trust that God will bring good out of that painful divorce that happened within your home. That means God will bring good out of that sinful, nasty adultery that has taken place. That means we can trust that God will bring good out of the sibling rivalry within your family. Our God brings good out of evil. And if you're here today and you're a student and you've gone through something that is incredibly difficult at school and it hurts, You can trust that our God will bring good out of evil. This applies to every single area of our life. And how should the Christian respond to the fact that God brings good out of evil? Should this cause us to sin flippantly? Of course not. Absolutely not. Should this cause us to take advantage of the grace of God? Absolutely not. But when we do sin and we do feel the pain of the consequences that we rightly deserve, we can be a people who still have hope. Why? Because our God brings good out of evil. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, as we open up your word this morning, Lord, I confess I need your help with this text. It is a difficult text to navigate. There are problems here. There are sin issues within this family that need to be addressed. But I pray, God, most of all, that you would turn our attention to heaven, that we would look upward and that we would see that although you might be invisible throughout this story, that you are most at work when we don't see you. Help us, Father, to see that you are God and we are not. Humble us this day. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God brings good out of evil. Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, it says this. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Right off the bat, we see that there is a significant problem happening between both sisters. Leah is unloved. The text says she's hated. Rachel is barren. And I think this is very significant for us to, to notice. For most women, the relationships that are nearest and dearest to their heart is a woman's relationship to her husband and a woman's relationship to her children. If one of these two relationships is wrong, if there's something out of whack, if it's not how it ought to be, it will be consuming for the woman. She will not be able to feel like things are right in her life until these two relationships are what they ought to be. And so God in his providence allows and brings these problems into these women's life, not because he hates them, but because he loves them. He wants to refine their character. And remember, God brings good out of evil. The text says that Leah was hated by her husband, Jacob. The word hated in Hebrew here means unloved. Jacob loved Leah less than he loved Rachel. And sometimes the word hated in Hebrew here even refers to looking at someone like they are your enemy. And so I think it's safe for me to assume that there were times when Jacob looked at Leah and he looked at her like she was his enemy. Think of all the things Leah had to endure. For starters, Leah's name means wild cow. Remember that? She is a shy, timid girl. She's the less pretty sister. Not only that, she was pawned off by dad at her sister's wedding. She married a man who didn't love her. Remember, Jacob worked 14 years for Rachel. He didn't work a single second for Leah. Leah is the wife who is unloved. Leah is the girl no one wanted. And I think we look at Leah's life and we wonder how could any good come out of Leah being unloved? Well, actually the text tells us. The very beginning of this verse actually tells us how good can come out of being unloved. The very beginning of the verse says, the Lord saw the Lord saw that Leah was unloved. And when the Bible says the Lord saw, you can be sure that God is about to act in a way that benefits the person he sees. In this case, he sees unloved, unwanted Leah. But God can bring good out of the evil of being an unloved spouse. Verse 32. And Leah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Even though Leah was unloved, God loved her. God blessed her 
with children. Her and Jacob have a child together, and they na- uh, actually Leah names him Reuben. Reuben means the Lord has looked and seen my affliction. And so she hopes with this child that her husband will love her. You see, what Leah wants most is her husband's love. Is that too much to ask for? She wants to be loved by her husband, cherished by her husband, cared for by her husband. She wants to be held and protected by her husband. She wants to be seen by her husband. And Leah hopes, maybe, just maybe, this child will be used to cause my husband to love me. Verse 33. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Leah now has son number two with Jacob. I want you to notice though, she still says the Lord has heard that I am what? Hated. Even though she's given her husband not just one son, but two sons, he still does not love her. Could you just imagine waking up every single day knowing that your spouse doesn't love you? Leah lives in a loveless marriage, and a loveless marriage feels like a prison cell with no way out. Verse 34, again, Leah conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. Leah now has son number three with Jacob. She calls his name Levi. She says, now that I have this son, now, now maybe, just maybe, my husband will be attached to me. But here's the truth. No matter how many children Leah has, Leah will always be the girl no one wanted. And Grace family, what we have to understand is that your children cannot fix your marriage problems. There are so many people today who believe the solution to their married, married problems, marriage problems is to have children. They think to themselves, man, I'm struggling, you're struggling, I know what we should do, let's have kids, then everything will be better. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Children will not fix your marriage problems. Children do not have the ability to fix the dysfunction within the home and the family. That is something only God can do. Children have a way of magnifying our sinfulness because they're sinful just like mom and dad. And so not even kids makes Jacob love Leah. And so finally, verse 35, we see a change. It is not a change in Leah's situation, but it is a change in Leah's perspective. Verse 35, and she conceived again. And bore a son. And she said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. And so Leah has son number four. Leah calls him Judah. And I want you to notice something here. There are four verses here. And these, these verses are short for us, but they were long. For Leah, there are years that are going on through these verses. It is years that her husband doesn't love her. It is years God allows her to suffer in this way. And God is using it to refine her character and to change her perspective until finally she has the fourth son, Judah. And even though she's unloved, she says, I will praise the Lord. Praise here is the Hebrew word for yada. It is the Hebrew word to lift up your hands. And so although Leah is unloved and unwanted, 
She says, I will yada, I will lift up my hands, I will praise the Lord because God is my true source of love. I want to pause here for a moment and speak directly to the husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Do not only love her for her body. Do not only love her because of sex. Do not only love her because she can give you children. Love her like Christ loved the church. Love her more than you love your job. Love her more than you love your money. Love her more than you love her, your hobbies. Tell her that you love her and show her that you love her. Never stop getting to know your wife that God has blessed you with. Love her sacrificially. Love her when she doesn't deserve it. Love her even when it hurts husbands. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. And married women, I think there's something here for you as well. Do not make an idol out of your husband. Your husband will never be able to satisfy your soul. Your husband will never be able to be to you what only Jesus can be to you. Your true source of love is not your husband. It is Christ. Leah wants her husband's love more than anything else. No matter how many children she gives him, she'll never be able to receive that love from him. But Grace family, our God brings good out of evil. And this is really the first place we see it. Number one, God brings good out of an unloved wife. How is that possible? Here's how. Jesus Christ will come through the line of Leah, the unwanted wife. He is a descendant of her son, Judah. From this unloved wife would come the lion of Judah, whose roar will shake the very foundations of all of creation. And isn't it poetic? From the unwanted wife would come the unwanted savior. Jesus was a man of many sorrows. He was despised. He was rejected by his own people. But from this unwanted wife would come the unwanted savior of the world. And you and I are here today because God used this unwanted wife to bring this unwanted savior. And Jesus, the unwanted savior, saved you and me from our sins and from the wrath of God that we rightly deserve. And even though you and I didn't even want him, he loved us first. He loved us first. Why? Because our God brings good out of evil. Amen. Genesis 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw, there's that saw again that we, we saw earlier. When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. Remember a few minutes ago, we saw Genesis 29, verse 31. The text said, the Lord saw. And when God sees, he always acts in a way that benefits the person that he is seeing. This time, the text says, Rachel saw. And Rachel will not act in a way that benefits her sister. And she will not act in a way that benefits her husband. She will act in a way that benefits herself. At the end of verse 1, it says that Rachel envied her sister. Envy here means that she is grieving over her sister's happiness. Instead of being happy for her sister, instead of rejoicing that her unloved, unwanted sister had children, Rachel is envious of her sister. And I think this must have been very difficult for Rachel to see. I mean, think about it. Rachel's not used to taking a back seat to her sister Leah. I think Rachel was used to always being better than Leah. I mean, think about it. Rachel was more attractive than Leah. Jacob worked 14 years for Rachel. He didn't work a single second for Leah. 
Rachel was even more loved than Leah. And so I think in a way, Rachel here is like a pouting kid who sees her sister have children and she's envious of her. Now, I don't want to make light out of the pain that comes with barrenness. One of the most difficult, heart-wrenching things a couple can go through is barrenness. And there are people in our congregation who are able to have children. And there are people in our congregation who are not able to have children. As a community, as a, as a faith community, as a church, as the body of Christ, we are to weep with those who weep and we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. And so instead of rejoicing with her sister, Rachel becomes envious. And then at the very end of verse one, we see Rachel lashes out at her husband, Jacob. She says, give me children or I shall die. And she blames Jacob for her barrenness. In verse two, how does Jacob respond? Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? The word kindled here in Hebrew means that Jacob became red hot. He's seeing red. His heart rate begins to skyrocket. And he angrily looks at his wife and he tells her, don't blame me. It's not my fault. I'm not the author of life. I'm not God. It's not my fault. Don't be mad at me. God is the one who determines who has kids and who doesn't. Now, I think there's something to be said here because Jacob does have good theology, but I think he shares this theology, this understanding of God in an incorrect kind of a way. Jacob is right. God is the author of life, but I think Jacob is wrong in how he shares this truth with his wife in an explosive kind of a way. I, I think this is important for us to see because we need the right temperature when we give out the medicine of truth. Jacob, Jacob really should have said, honey, listen, I know this situation isn't ideal. I know this isn't what we wanted. This isn't what I wanted, but we need to come together and we need to pray and we need to trust in the promises of God. God made a promise to make us a great nation and, and you're a part of that promise. So let's come together and let's pray and cry out to him and wait and see what God does. But instead, Jacob doesn't do that. Jacob ultimately yells at his wife and is angry. Jacob is angry. Rachel is angry. And I think their anger reveals that they are ultimately both angry with God who is not providing for them in this way. And so where does Jacob's lack of leadership and Rachel's envy lead us? It leads to sibling rivalry. It leads to a tangled mess of sin and a dysfunctional home. But again, Grace family, remember, God brings good out of evil. Let's see how. Verse three, then Rachel said, here's my servant Bilhah. Go into her so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. And so Rachel attempts to take matters into her own hands. And instead of waiting and praying and trusting, she turns to her maidservant to be that solution. She says, Jacob, marry my maidservant and have a child with her. And then that child will be considered my child. Isn't this Abraham and Hagar all over again? I, I want us to see what Rachel wants most. Rachel wants children most. And I, I think it's safe to say Rachel wants kids more than she wants God. I, I think this is important for us to see parents because we need to be very careful. We need to walk a fine line. We need to see our kids as a blessing. Our kids, our teenagers, our young adults, we need to see our kids as a blessing, but we need to make sure we don't worship them. We need to make sure we don't idolize our kids and, and give them the place of God within our hearts. I think we need to be very careful about doing this because our kids were never, ever, ever meant 
to carry the burden of Godhood on their shoulders. It will crush them completely. And so verse four, it continues and it says, so she, Rachel, gave Jacob her servant Bilhah as a wife. That's wife number three now for Jacob. And Jacob went into her. Verse five, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Verse six, then Rachel said, God has judged me and has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. In other words, Rachel is saying, ah, here, see, here we go. God's answered my prayers. Even God knows that it's completely unfair that Leah is able to have kids instead of me. And she considers her maidservant's baby her own and names him Dan. Verse seven, Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again, bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said with a mighty rustling, I have wrestled with my sister and I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. And so again, Rachel uses her maidservant. Jacob has a second son with Rachel's maidservant. She names her son's maidservant or her maidservant's son Naphtali. And she does it because she's feuding with her sister. Could you just imagine naming one of your kids uh, a Hebrew name, which means take that sister? Could you just imagine that? Isn't that crazy? But this is what's going on here. I, I can almost hear a sports announcer uh, saying, and the score is Leah four and Rachel two. Momentum have shifted into Rachel's favor. Who will bring home the gold for their husband's love and for most children? It's crazy, right? It's a little ridiculous. This is a tangled web. Verses nine through 10, when Leah saw, there's that saw again, that she had ceased bearing children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to, be Jacob, uh, gave her to Jacob as a wife, wife number four. Then Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. We come to verses nine and 10. This time, Leah saw. First, God saw. Then Rachel saw. Now Leah saw. And Leah will now act not for the benefit of her sister, not for the benefit of her husband, but for the benefit of herself. And you can almost hear her saying, all right, sister, if you can use your maidservant, two can play at that game. I'll use my maidservant as well. And so she takes her maidservant, Zilpah, Zilpah has a child with Jacob, and Leah counts that son as her own. Verses 11 through 13, and Leah said, good fortune has come. So she called his name Gad. I want you to notice Leah owes it all to good fortune. Leah, what happened to Yada? What happened to I will praise the Lord? It seems as if this sibling rivalry has, called, uh, has caused her to regress. She's been consumed by this. Verse 12, Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, happy am I, for women have called me happy. So she called his name Asher. You see what the sisters are doing, right? Back and forth back and forth. They're putting their feelings into words by what they name their sons. Leah says, essentially says, I am so much more happy than my sister, Rachel, who can't have kids. The score is now six to two, Rachel. Take that. And I just want to pause here for a moment and highlight that Jacob now has four wives, I want us to see the problem with polygamy. And not just that, but the problem uh, that happens when we attempt to define marriage in our own way. God, in the very beginning of Genesis, defined marriage. God, in the very beginning of the Bible, uh, designed marriage, defined marriage, told us how it must be done. Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I'm also reminded of the New Testament, 
One of the qualifications of an elder is that the man must be a one-woman man. He must be a one-woman man who is committed to his wife. And throughout the text, Jacob is allowing his two wives to have this sibling rivalry, just like him and his brother Esau had. And instead of leading them, instead of promoting peace amongst them, Jacob stays really quiet throughout this whole chapter. In fact, the only time we really see Jacob doing anything is when he's yelling at his wife or when he's uh, having children with these women. And so Jacob comes off as uh, essentially saying in his silence, ladies, ladies, there's enough of Jacob to go around. He, He almost is enjoying it. Man, listen to me. What is one of the things that makes a man a man? The world will tell you it is by how many women you can have. That's not true. God says a man is a man if he has a wife and he is committed to just her. If you want to be countercultural, be committed to your wife. If you want to be countercultural, be committed and fully in love with your wife. Don't lust, fight against the temptation. Do what you can to love her and adore her and cherish her. Put her first before all other women. She is your wife. Be committed to her. Verses 14 through 15. If you think things were crazy now, they get a lot crazier. Hang on. Verses 14 through 15. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben, he's the firstborn son of Leah, He went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Remember, again, Reuben, he's the the oldest child. He goes out into the fields. He finds this rare type of plant. It's called a mandrake. It was very rare in that area that they lived in. Uh, Mandrakes, uh, people believe during this time, were uh, could be fashioned into a type of love potion, basically. That's what they thought they were used for. And so they believed that if a woman took this love potion, this mandrake, it would increase a woman's fertility. There's a lot of people today who believe that too. And so at the very end of verse 14, it says, Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. And I think this is actually pretty polite of Rachel, don't you? She even uses the word please here. She, she's basically saying, Leah, you know, I can't have kids like you. Maybe if you let me have some of those mandrakes, I'll be able to give birth. Verse 15, but she, Leah, said to her, is it a small matter that you've taken my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Leah immediately snaps. She doesn't even bat an eye. She doesn't even waste any time. She instantly sees red. This hit a nerve in her heart. She says, you've already stolen my husband. You want to steal my mandrakes now? Isn't it interesting that Leah accuses Rachel of stealing her husband when technically, technically, it was Leah who first stole Jacob. At the end of verse 15, Rachel said, then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. Yeah, you heard that right. Rachel basically prostitutes Jacob out to her sister in order to get her hands on a mandrake. Drama, drama, drama. Nothing more than sister rivalry. I mean, there's more drama here in this text than there is in Hollywood. Now, Now, why is it, though, that mandrakes are so important here? Why is it that mandrakes... Are important. Why is the text telling us about this? I think it's because Rachel is putting her trust in mandrakes instead of the word of God. God promised this family, I will, I will, I will make you a great nation. Not mandrakes, not love potions, but God will make them a great nation. And God is the one who is the, uh, the author of life. And it is God who blesses couples with children. And so really what we're seeing here is that Rachel clings to mandrakes and it reveals her heart. She still has not bowed to the providence of God. Let me ask you, Grace family, do you believe that God can bring good out of evil? 
what we have to understand here today is that God has every right to do what he wants with our lives. He does not need our permission. He, he does not need our approval. He is God and we are not. And he is acting as God in your life today. Whether you want him to or not, he is God and we are not. Verse 16 through 18. When Jacob came from the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me for I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night and God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages because I gave my servant to my husband. So she called his name Ishkar. You know, isn't it ironic? The sister who gives up the mandrake ends up having a child. Rachel, who clings to mandrakes, still does not have a child. 19 through 21. And Leah conceived again. And she bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now, now my husband will honor me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun afterward. She bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Leah still wants her husband to love her. And he still does not love her. He still does not love her as his wife. What a mess. What a tangled web that we have here. This sibling rivalry has torn this family apart. It's hard to even call this family a family because of how they act like an enemy towards each other. And what's sad is that this sibling rivalry between Leah and Rachel will even trickle down and spread amongst the children. How can any good possibly come out of this sibling rivalry? That's what I want you to see here. Number two, God brings good out of sibling rivalry. How? Well, you might not know this, but this is actually the origin story of the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of this sibling rivalry will come all these kids, and, out, and from all these sons will come the 12 tribes of Israel. And Israel will be the nation God will use throughout the Old Testament to set his glory on display. And from Israel will come the patriarchs and the prophets and the Old Testament, and even Christ himself will come out of these 12 tribes. And so you could just imagine an Israelite reading this. Moses is writing it to them and he's helping them to see, let's be careful not to think we're so high and mighty than the other nations. Look at our origin story. We come out of a tangled mess, a family that's dysfunctional. But there's a truth here we have to hold on to. God brings good out of evil. Last verses we'll cover today. Genesis 30, 22 through 24. Then God remembered Rachel. It was at that moment God then remembered Rachel. At just the right time, God remembered Rachel. And it says, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. She called his name Joseph, saying, may the Lord add to me another son. This is beautiful. It says here that God remembered Rachel. That doesn't mean that God forgot Rachel, like you and I forget what we had for breakfast this morning. No, it means that God is putting his hand on Rachel in a special way. He's about to open her womb in a special way. It, it, the text even says, God listened to Rachel. I, I think this means that God brought Rachel to a place where she saw that she only had him. No more maidservants, no more mandrakes, just Rachel and God. And God blesses her and he opens her womb and Rachel gives birth to a son and that son's name is Joseph. And then she says, God has taken away my reproach, my disgrace, my inability to have children. 
And then she ends by saying, may the Lord add to me another son. What does Rachel want most? Children. Is one enough? No. She ends by demanding God to give her more. I want to land this plane this morning by highlighting how God brings good out of this woman's barrenness. And that's the third and final point for you. This barren woman, she has a, a son named Joseph. And if you know anything about Joseph, you know Joseph at the end of Genesis will be a major player. Joseph one day will grow up and become second in command in Egypt. From this barren woman, God would bring this boy, Joseph, and when the land experiences barrenness from a famine, it will be Joseph God uses to bless the nations. Why? Because our God brings good out of evil. Rachel has no idea, but God had a, uh, had a plan for the exact moment he wanted Joseph to be born. She couldn't see it. She couldn't understand it. But it's true. God brings good out of evil. Grace family, look at your life right now. I want you to look at the place in your life where you think no good will ever come out of. Maybe that's within your family. Maybe that's within your marriage. Maybe you feel like you've reached that place with your kids or your, your siblings. Maybe you feel that way you're here and you're feeling that way about school today. I want to speak truth into that. God can bring good out of evil. He's done it before and he will do it again. Let's pray.